Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Welcome back to Spanish 55690 with your professor, Dr. Jason Jolly. Nice to have you back for another video. And I just wanted to say before we get started that these videos are really just really brief overviews. I'm not going to delve into specifics. They're meant to sort of be starting points to orient your thinking so that you know how I'm thinking about these topics. And then you guys, in particular, the graduate students can kind of go off on your own and dig a little bit deeper. And that's exactly what I expect of the graduate students in Spanish 690. For the 590 students, this is just kind of an informative overview about, uh, about grammar. So welcome to this video on definitions of grammar, the second video for the course. Um, quick video overview. We're going to talk about popular ideas about grammar, what most people think grammar means. We'll take a look at a more systematic framework that I like. We'll talk about how linguists talk about grammar. And we'll even touch briefly on some theoretical conceptualizations. That's a hard word to say. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about what it means to be grammatically accurate, right? To be right, to speak properly. And then we'll come back to our definitions of grammatical competence and then really settle on what do we mean by grammaticality and grammar in Spanish 590 and 690. So, um, excuse me, I'm going to be referring to my notes a little bit, guys, um, during this because um, I need to. Um, but that's all right. Um, one of the primary objectives uh, in this course is to improve our grammatical competence, a phrase that implies that we want to become better or more competent at something, and that that something is grammar. If that's our goal, it's obviously important to clarify what we mean by grammar, at least when we talk about it in this sense in our course. But another objective is to increase our general understanding about of what grammar is and the role it plays in communication and language learning and instruction. So what's grammar? What role does it play in communication? What's, why is it so important in language instruction and language learning? These ideas are a little bit harder to pin down, but the starting point is to recognize that grammar can mean, grammar does mean different things to different people. So there's just not one singular definition of grammar and it can be understood and analyzed in a variety of ways. So before we settle on a definition suitable for our purposes in Spanish 590-690, let's take a broader look at a few definitions and types of grammar. We'll also touch on a few concepts that are important to understand when talking about grammar in language teaching and language learning concepts. So if we were to ask the average person on the street, right, what's grammar? I think most people would say, oh, grammar, that's they would think about, okay, those are those rules we learn in school for using language the right way, right? Saying things the way we should say them. And they might refer to, oh, it's when you use correct forms and correct structures, right? Especially people think about, I think, verb conjugations. Or folks might talk about, oh, it's all those labels you learn, you know, adjectives, adverbs, prepositions, the verb tenses, right? If they've taken a language class. So you have the, the present, the past, the imperfect, the preterite, the subjunctive, the indicative, right? So those labels might be top of mind for them. Some people might think also, right, if they've been through a composition class, oh, you have to spell correctly. It's about punctuation. It's about capitalization. We're going to talk a little bit later in this video about how those things are not really grammar. Those are mechanics of writing, right? Spelling, punctuation, capitalization, the use of accents. And then other folks, I think, for them, grammar is anything other than those words that have that primary semantic value that refer to something like nouns, adjectives and adverbs, so the more functional elements of language, and again, particularly things like verb forms, conjunctions, prepositions, uh, pronouns, etc. So those are some popular ideas about grammar that are swirling out there if we happen to ask this guy in the street who happens to be from Italy, so we might not understand him all that well. All right, but let's, let's take a little bit more systematic approach. Um, I found a description of grammar in this book, Teaching Grammar in Context by Constance Weaver. Uh, that I really like. She breaks it down into three or four different areas. The first one, right, is what she calls grammar as, quote, a description of the syntax of language. And so that's parts of speech, elements or categories. So when we talk about nouns, adverbs, adjectives, prepositions, right? And then syntactic structures, right? Putting those together to form phrases, clauses, and sentences, different types of sentences. So one description of grammar is or one definition of grammar is a description of the syntax of a language, and that word description is important. She goes on to talk about a second area, right? And that has to do with um, using the language system right, 
right? So correct sentence structure, correct punctuation, and other aspects of mechanics. Again, those aren't necessarily grammar as we understand it. And appropriate usage using the standard or educated forms, right? And so as opposed to a description of the language system, she calls this a set of prescriptions or rules for using language. So according to her, this is another aspect of grammar. And then thirdly, she says it has to do with style, right? What she calls sentence sense, or the effective use of all those syntactic options that a language gives us. Um, she calls this third category the rhetorically effective use of syntactic structures. So just writing or speaking with style, okay? And then I'm gonna read this last paragraph in full because it's really important, so follow along because she brings up a fourth one. So she says, underlying these senses of grammar is a more fundamental one, the unconscious command of syntax that enables us to understand and speak the language. So I underline that or I put that in bold, I think that's important. Then she goes on to say, even toddlers use grammatical constructions that are reductions and precursors of the more mature syntax they'll eventually acquire. In this most fundamental sense then, we do not need to teach grammar at all. That's something that we're going to explore in this course. The grammar of our native language is part of what we learn in acquiring that language. Furthermore, and this next part is also, uh, there's not consensus on what she's about to say, non-native speakers of a language can acquire the language in much the same way as native speakers, given similar kinds of opportunities to hear, use, read, and write the language. So she makes a couple claims there about how we acquire language and the ability of second language learners to acquire a language, but I think it's important her definition, right? Grammar as the unconscious command of syntax or rules that enable us to understand and speak the language. So I like all four of those pillars of her more systematic approach. Now in linguistics, right, we have a slightly different, or there's some similarities actually. Constance Weaver set us up really nicely to talk about what do linguists mean when they, when they talk about grammar? Well, in linguistics, grammar refers to, and I took this straight from Wikipedia, don't hold that against me guys. Grammar refers to the rules of a language that govern how it builds and combines sounds, words, phrases, and clauses. And grammar, when linguists talk about it, generally includes the fields of phonology, morphology, and syntax, right? So one way to boil that down is for linguists, and I'm really generalizing here though, grammar would be the rules that govern a language system, or its subsystems like phonology, morphology, and syntax, okay? So in particular, many times when uh, linguists talk about grammar, they're referring to syntax, which has to do with the rules that govern sentence formation, and maybe morphology, which are those rules for combining little constituent parts of words to form well-formed words in, in a language, okay? But do notice what's missing. When, when linguists talk about grammar, they're usually not talking about those mechanics of writing where you see all that red ink on your English compositions, right? Or your Spanish compositions, things like spelling mistakes, pronouns, uh, it says punctuation, I'm sorry, punctuation and capitalization, right? Or the use of accents. Those things I like to call the mechanics of writing, okay? Um, let me check my notes here. Okay, so these features, right? Spelling, punctuation, capitalization, the use of accents, right? are not considered usually in linguistic circles to be part of a language's grammar. They're simply rules for formal writing, okay? So I wanted to make that point. So the point is um, that rather than a bunch of rules codified that you're gonna find in a high school textbook, right? Or a Spanish textbook, right? Um, linguists understand grammar as the internalized, largely unconsciously held, right? Intuitively held rules that allow speakers of a language to recognize well-formed sentences and to produce grammatical sentences of their own, right? So when somebody says, uh, a native speaker says, that just doesn't sound right. The way he said that, I wouldn't say it that way, right? They're falling back on those intuitive rules that were formed when they were very young, right? As native speakers acquiring that language, that's their grammar. And linguists can sometimes test the parameters of this uh, grammar that native speakers have by administering what are called GSTs or grammaticality judgment tests. They'll give them a bunch of um, enunciations, right, or propositions, uh, sentences, and ask them to rate how grammatical they sound, right? Um, another couple of points I just wanted to mention while we're on the topic of how linguists uh, talk about grammar 
is that as we saw in Constance Weaver's um, differentiation, they do talk about a difference between prescriptive grammars and descriptive grammars. So a descriptive grammar is an effort to describe how native speakers are utilizing or employing the language, right? A prescriptive grammar is those rules that tell us how we should use grammar, right? And so there's that distinction between how people actually use language, right? And we're describing that, that's the grammar based on our observations, or a prescriptive grammar, which is, this is how language should be used according to the rules, right? This is right, this is wrong, okay? There's some overlap there, right? Um, and then uh, the distinction between competence and performance, this comes from Chomsky's work, right? Noam Chomsky, linguist from MIT, um, his theory of universal grammar or generative transformational grammar. Um, the idea of competence, linguistic competence versus performance, right? So in the Chomskyan universe, right, competence are those, is what a native speaker, right, or proficient speaker knows intuitively usually about the language, right? They know how to form the past tense. Their language system, the rules that they've internalized, allow them to differentiate between the imperfect and the preterite, right? They have that as competence, the knowledge about the language system. Performance, on the other hand, is how they actually deploy language. And sometimes in performance, even um, native speakers will make mistakes. So we'll come back to this idea a little bit later when we talk about accuracy. But basically, you can Google all of the stuff in the lesson and learn quite a bit about it. But I'm just so I'm trying to give you an outline of sort of things that I think are important when we discuss language. And it's really just bare bones and you're welcome to and encouraged to actually to go um, research a little bit more. So prescriptive, descriptive, competence, performance, these types of things, look them up, all right? And then, so if we're talking about grammar as that internalized set of rules, right? Parameters, right? Principles and parameters in Chomskyan terms, right? That humans acquire. One of the things that researchers in second language acquisition and first language acquisition, I think, um, are trying to discover through their research is how we humans acquire these rules, right? As we learn our first language and our subsequent languages, okay? Okay, so this kind of leads into the idea that um, even within linguistics, right, there are many theories about how languages work and about how our, how our minds or how language is represented, language including grammar, right, um, is represented in our minds, okay? And our knowledge about and ability to use um, how, that, how that develops in our minds, right? And again, here is an area where I'm not going to go into detail, right, just out of for time constraints. And also I want to encourage, in particular the graduate students, point them in the direction of maybe doing a little bit more research on these five bullet points, right? So you have um, flowing out of Chomsky's work in the late 1950s all the way through the 60s, 70s and beyond, right? This notion of the one type of grammar is transformational generative grammar, right? So this has to do with, this flows from universal grammar, the idea of surface structure, deep structure, Right, the idea that a grammar um, has to be able to um, account for right generating right um, grammatical sentences, an infinite number of grammatical sentences from a finite number of, of rules. Right. So look, at, I'm going to give you on the next slide some very very basic starting points. Right, because each one of these has been the area of immense amount of literature and study. Um, phrase structure grammar and dependency grammar are two ways of representing, right, um, grammar and language in the mind, right? And then, and they're kind of a break, right, transformational generative grammar, phrase structure grammar, dependency grammars, they're kind of breaks from that earlier structuralist and behaviorist perspective, right? And then cognitive and construction grammars are breaks from this more formalist approach. So again, let me give you guys some sources here, right? So if you download this PowerPoint from Blackboard, you'll be able to click on these links and just see a very basic introductory reading about universal grammar, uh, transformational generative grammar, phrase structure and dependency grammars, which are two ways of representing a syntax, right? And then what I find really interesting are these cognitive and construction grammars, right? Which kind of um, eliminate the distinction between lexis and, and syntax, okay? So let me see if there's anything else there I wanted to say. I mean, another reason I'm bringing this up in the context of our course is because 
I think it's important to be aware that grammar means different things to different people and that there are all these conceptualizations and models out there because um, these have implications for teaching, certainly. If you think grammar is acquired, language is represented a certain way in the mind, that should affect how you go about teaching, but also as a language learner, so for you undergraduate students, right? Understanding how the mind represents language, right? Um, and that the idea that there are different models for this can help you to locate researches, uh, locate resources, and to decide to use different strategies when you're learning and practicing grammar. Okay, okay. Um, so just a couple notes about accuracy, right? I like this picture, right? You better say it the right way, okay? So when discussing grammar, and especially the teaching of grammar and the use of grammar um, for language learners, right, language students, questions relating to accuracy or inaccuracy tend to arise. So things like, how important is it to speak and write correctly? Or what does that even mean? Or who decides, who gets to decide, right? Is it the teacher, right? Is it a native speaker? Who gets to decide what's accurate, what's inaccurate, what an error is, what a mistake is, right? And what happens, right? What happens if I make a mistake on an important language test or something like that, right? What is a mistake? So I just wanna mention a few things about accuracy because I think invariably when we talk about grammar, there's always that concern about doing things the right way. Right? So I came up with this um, after reading, consulting a few different sources, I came up with this sort of provisional, very provisional um, definition of accuracy as the ability to produce language that conforms to the accepted norms shared by native speakers, but particularly educated native speakers. Okay? Um, when it comes to inaccuracies, right? going back to that distinction we made between competence and performance, remember, um, I may have a lot of knowledge about the rules, right, for generating well-formed sentences in English, or in Spanish for that matter, or in Portuguese, but when I actually perform, when I produce language, I might make mistakes, right, big mistakes, small mistakes. Um, in linguistics, right, second language acquisition, right, language instruction, um, there's a distinction between errors and mistakes, distinction in the literature and in the research, right? Errors typically refer to competence, right? So they reflect a systematic gap or lack of that learner or speaker's knowledge of the system, right? Whereas mistakes are those performance missteps when we're trying to use the language. And native speakers even often make mistakes, but they just recognize them really quickly and can correct them, right? Um, Non-native speakers learning a language may make errors, right, that reflect a systematic kind of gap in their knowledge, okay? Um, so that's, that's an important distinction to remember that reflects that competence-performance distinction. Um, it's also interesting, I don't know if it's that important, but it's interesting to point out that accuracy is not the same as uh, fluency, right? So for me, flu and we just defined accuracy at the top of this slide, for me, fluency, right, what it means to be fluent is to speak um, with fluidity, right, with a certain degree of almost automation, right, to speak coherently. Um, so, to speak smoothly, right, quickly in some cases. So, when, to me, when somebody says, you're speaking very fluently, it has to do with the rate of speech, right, the smoothness, the fluidity, right? It's not necessarily the same as proficiency and not necessarily the same as accuracy, right? Now, both accuracy and fluency, I think, are important if our if for standard is speaking or writing like a native speaker, right? But they're not necessarily the same thing. It's been said that you can be um, accurate without being fluent. So think of somebody who speaks very cautiously, super slowly, so they don't make any mistakes, right, or their errors don't surface. They're filtering, they're monitoring, right? And theoretically, at least, you could also say the opposite is true. Somebody could be fluent, right? They could speak really smoothly, really quickly, have great pronunciation, but they might make a lot of mistakes or there might be some systematic errors in their production, okay? So anyways, I think that's just important to note, right? We always want to use accurate language and terminology, okay? And then it's important to consider also that um, when we're thinking about 
the use of grammar and questions of accuracy, it's very important to point out that um, we need to consider contextual factors, right? So being right, using the language properly, the importance of that might vary. Are we speaking or writing, right? I think usually the expectation for accuracy goes up if we're using written language, right? What's the setting, right? Are we hanging out at a bar during a happy hour with our colleagues, right? Might be, mis might be okay if we're not 100% accurate, right? Versus are we making a presentation, a research presentation at a conference, right? So what's the setting, the time, place, location, the participants in that particular active language? What's the genre? What's the purpose, right? There are some regional differences too. We need to be careful because linguists don't necessarily tend to make um, value judgments about somebody's linguistic production, right? And so differences in regional speech, right? They may not mean that that person is saying it wrong. They're saying it right where they live, okay? So again, the importance of accuracy depends a little bit on what you're trying to accomplish, what's the context, what's the purpose, right? Um, all right, so that brings us back full circle, I think, to the notion of grammatical competence that we talked about in the first video. Um, there's a very influential model out there of communicative competence by Canali and Swain, right? Uh, 1980, 1983 are the references on that. You can look it up. Um, and they came up with a model of communicative competence, and one of the areas there is grammatical competence, which, according to these researchers, consists of knowledge of lexical items, so words, and of rules of morphology, syntax, sentence grammar, semantics, and phonology. So that's that idea of knowledge about the language system and its subsystems. And also the ability to recognize and produce the distinctive grammatical structures of a language and to use them effectively in communication. Now, second bullet point there in Canali and Swain reminds me of what we just saw um, Constant Weaver saying, right? That aspect of grammar that is the unconscious command of syntax that enables us to understand and speak the language, okay? And in the previous video, right, the course intro video, I sort of laid out, when I say grammatical competence in this class, I'm talking about four or five different things, right? Knowledge about the language system, its forms and structures, that intuitive sense that allows us to say, yeah, that sentence is grammatical, that is well formed, that's how you would say that word, that's how you would combine those phrases and clauses. Um, the ability to use those structures with control, with accuracy, but also fluency, right? The ability to talk about the language system, right, the grammar system, to use meta-language, to have that meta-linguistic meta awareness, I think is part of grammatical competence. And then what we're going to develop in this course, I hope, is an awareness of our own strengths and weaknesses in these areas. So finally, right, ready to talk a little bit about um, within this framework that I just laid out of grammatical competence, right, um, for our own language use and for the purpose of teaching it to others. This is basically what I mean by grammatical and grammar in the context of Spanish 590 and 690, and with this, I'll let you guys go and Google all those interesting concepts, right? Um, so, first of all, I think we need to define the term grammatical, right? Um, because my definition of grammar refers back to grammatical. So, a sentence or another expressive unit, a phrase or a clause or a word, is grammatical when it conforms to sentence formation rules held intuitively by native speakers when they go, yeah, she said that right. Um, grammar refers to then, so grammar, right? Grammar for Spanish 590, 690 refers to these two things. The internalized rules native speakers hold intuitively, allowing them to recognize and create grammatical sentences in Spanish, okay? And it also refers to descriptions of those rules and their various components in teaching and learning contexts, right? So again, grammar are those rules in the minds of native speakers that they know intuitively that allow them to recognize and to create well-formed sentences. That's what all of us as language learning learners are striving to develop, right? But it also refers to what you probably thought before the course, those explanations, descriptions, analyses of language rules and their various components, nouns, verbs, clauses, relative pronouns, etc. when we're teaching and learning a language. So hopefully this overview has been helpful to you. This is what I mean by grammar. I've tried to give you guys just a little bit of a, the idea that grammar is a huge topic out there in language teaching, in linguistics, in theoretical linguistics, 
And so hopefully I've opened your eyes a little bit and especially those graduate students, I want to encourage you guys to go back to the slide on theoretical conceptualizations and maybe click on those links and start exploring those, those five or six different areas. All right. All right. That's it for this second video, grammar definitions. Um, go ahead and take the quiz. Best of luck to y'all. Hasta luego. Ciao.